Welcome to the Forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. My name is Julie Steenhuisen. I'm a health and science correspondent at Reuters, and this forum is being held in conjunction with Reuters. Um, this forum will all be uh, part of a live blog that will be going on at Reuters.com. Um, our topic today is Alzheimer's testing. Right now, there is no de definitive test for Alzheimer's disease, but researchers are coming close. Um, right now, there are three companies that are trying to get uh, an imaging test approved with the FDA and commercialized. And recently, this, as recently as this week, uh, at the Alzheimer's Association's International Conference in Paris, there were studies being presented on retinal scans, on blood tests, and on spinal fluids um, that can detect Alzheimer's in um, some of its earliest stages before symptoms appear. There also appears to be some interest in testing, as Dr. one of our guests, Dr. Blender, will talk about. Um, and the question is, um, with testing for Alzheimer's disease, when is it appropriate if there are no effective drugs that are available that can interfere with the process of this disease? Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce my panel. Um, to my left is Matthew Baumgart. Matthew is the Senior Director of Government Affairs at the Alzheimer's Association. Um, Adrian Ivinson, who is the founding director of the Harvard Neurodiscovery Center. And Robert Blendon, who is professor of health policy and political analysis at the Harvard School of Public Health. And he's also executive director of the Harvard Opinion Research Program here. Um, thank you for coming. And um, we're going to have a period of question and answer uh, a little bit later. But right now, I want to ask uh, my panel a few questions. And I believe Dr. Blendon has uh, some slides for us. He was recently at, in, at the Alzheimer's Association meeting in Paris. And he's going to present some new research uh, that we'll be discussing on this topic. So let me just take a couple minutes in background to set the stage for the discussion. Uh, we completed a five-country study of public attitudes towards Alzheimer's. France, Germany, Spain, Poland, and the United States. Uh, and uh, for those who need broader information, it has a, a wide range of issues, including people's awareness of symptoms and everything else. Why do you need five countries? Because there's a lot of assumptions that if you find something in one country, that it would be the same in others. When in reality, culture and experience with this disease could actually change quite significantly how I would say I want a test or a treatment. So we wanted to look across uh, both Europe uh, and the United States. We did this in conjunction uh, with uh, Alzheimer's Europe and then the broader Alzheimer's groups. Uh, uh, for that. It received a grant to Alzheimer's Europe from the uh, Bayer Corporation. The, uh, I want to summarize just the highlight of findings because it's going to set the dis discussion. The, uh, when we uh, looked at this, uh, we entered uh, a period where there had been a number of recommendations uh, by Alzheimer's groups and federal public health and medical research organizations that we should push back the encouragement of people who have earlier symptoms of Alzheimer's to get some sort of a medical assessment. And the question is, would people come and why wouldn't they come? And that's what we're going to discuss, the possibility that things won't be able to be done for them, the possibility they could face discrimination in employment and others. So even though some country studies had said they would come, we weren't sure across countries whether or not they, they uh, would come. So the findings in you know, these very large studies actually come down to a very small number that are really very important in our discussion. So first is across all five countries, if people had symptoms of confusion and memory loss that they thought might be Alzheimer's, they were quite interested in getting an assessment of whether or not it was. So uh, much larger, I think, than many people even would have anticipated. What are some of the unexpected findings, which will get right into our discussion? That is, across the five countries, a large number of people believe that there is a treatment or pharmaceutical that would slow the progression of this disease that is now sitting in doctor's offices available for them. So the people we're interviewing coming for a screen are also telling us that they expect more than the screen when they get there. Uh, likewise, uh, they believe there is currently a single reliable test that can tell you whether or not you have Alzheimer's or not. So when they arrive at the office, uh, many of them have anticipations uh, for that. 
Uh, we asked about the uh, issue which fascinates a lot of people interested in sort of the science, policy, and ethics of this. How about a test if you don't even have any symptoms? Would you want to get that? And, uh, yeah, and I'll show very quickly the results. We are very conservative in how we present those findings. That is, hypothetical questions about things that don't exist often get over-promising. So we did a scale, and I'm just going to focus on people who say they're very likely, but across uh, all five countries, a very significant number of people said they would very likely get a test in the absence uh, of symptoms, and that raises a whole series of issues if we ever have a test to uh, recommend. The uh, last set of findings had to do with uh, the, this issue is likely to be pushed onto the national agenda of a variety of these countries. People had a very uh, wide sense of experience with Alzheimer's, more than I would have expected, knew it. Uh, a third of families, uh, people said someone in their family had had it uh, for that. And then we gave them the standard list we do is here are seven major diseases. Uh, which one are you most concerned with? And in four of the five countries, Alzheimer's was number two after cancer. Uh, so let me summarize this quickly, and then we'll just look at just three quick uh, uh, slides. What is uh, uh, my takeaway as someone who looks at this? Uh, if people, as a policy, encourage people to come for earlier screening, they will come. Uh, and so these findings are, are latent. It just, I'm not going to get up in the morning and just go do that, but if you run campaigns telling people that we want you with these symptoms early on to come in, a lot of them will come up. Uh, the dilemma for clinicians will be that they will arrive with some of them with quite high expectations for what could be done, which may in some circumstances not be uh, uh, there. Uh, thirdly, if there is ever a test that this whole community says is reliable, a share of people will take it and it will have impacts on the, on, on the health system. We can't estimate in reality how many will, but millions across the five countries would do that. And uh, last is the, um, uh, that I think there is a treatment uh, available uh, and we asked them about the next five years. So the majority of people are sure there's going to be a breakthrough on this illness for medical science over the next five years. Uh, and so the, uh, the worrisome side is you're going to have people coming in expecting something and what can we do. The positive side is this is going to be a C pressure uh, for more medical research. If you believe that the darkness can be pushed away by medical research, you're going to want your governments to do more of this. So that's the takeaway, and I'll just show you three uh, uh, results, and we'll just illustrate uh, there are some cultural differences, and that's important when people generalize, particularly at international meetings, what we know everyone believes, they all don't believe the same. So let's just do this uh, quickly, but I'll give you, we had a whole barrage of symptoms, but there's one thing that was just uh, 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 stuck out, is that uh, we asked if you thought Alzheimer's was a fatal disease, which it is. In four of the five countries, the majority of people said, no, it's not a fatal disease. You die of something else. In the United States, we were the only country to know this. So even on the basic knowledge levels, let me see if we can. Uh, so on the first one, it's pretty easy. There's not much of a difference. Across all countries, uh, the public, if they had symptoms of Alzheimer's, uh, of confusion and memory loss, would go seek some sort of an assessment. Now, what's important, again, to understand from this is many of these people may want to be ruled out that they don't have Alzheimer's. It's not saying I absolutely know I have Alzheimer's and that's why I'm going. I have symptoms that could be Alzheimer's and I will go if somebody encourages me to do it. Uh, on the second is, is there an effective uh, treatment to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease and make the symptoms less severe, you can see the international differences where uh, the majority of people in Poland believe yes, the majority of people in Spain believe no, but a significant number across all countries. Uh, last one is, is there currently a reliable medical test? Uh, the U.S. is at the top of the charts in believing there is, but there's significant belief that when I go in and ask you for an assessment, you will have a reliable test. Uh, to deal with this, and this asks the hypothetical, how about if I didn't have symptoms but a test becomes available, and I try to focus my remarks just on the very likely, the top, 
uh, group because that's likely to be the pool when the time actually comes that actually might, might do that. You can see an international difference with Spain, the most likely, and Germany, the least likely. But if such a test became available, it's fair to say millions of people would take it and it would create a different change in the health system. That sort of just sets the tone for today's discussion. Well, thank you. Um, and I think you've raised quite a few points that we'll be discussing today. Um, the first question I wanted to, uh, to put to the panel is, you know, is there a benefit, given what we know about the situation with uh, disease-altering medications, is there a benefit then to encourage people to have early testing of Alzheimer's disease, and, and what is it? Um, I'll open it to Matthew first. Uh, I think there are a lot of benefits. I don't, um, um, there's some medical th that the doctor can talk about um, better than I can, um, but, there are, but there are also non-medical benefits. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen studies that show that the earlier that you have a diagnosis, the less stress there is for caregivers. Um, we have seen um, some evidence that there may be fewer falls and fewer accidents among those with the disease if they get diagnosed early, um, so that there's uh, 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 fewer hospitalizations, fewer rehospitalizations. Uh, care coordination, 95% um, of people with Alzheimer's have one or more other chronic uh, conditions, heart disease, diabetes. Um, if you're a doctor and you're treating those other conditions, it's very difficult to know how best to treat them if you don't know the person has dementia or Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th 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 there's a great example. I was, um, I was about a month ago, I was watching television and an advertisement, one of, those, one of those drug advertisements came on. It was a antidepressant drug. And at the end of all these ads, they all do all the disclaimers that the FDA requires them to do. And one of the disclaimers was, elderly patients with dementia should not take this drug. And I sat there and thought, now how, if you're the doctor treating the person with depression, treating the person's depression, how do you know not to give them this drug if you don't know they have dementia or Alzheimer's? So it makes, it makes the treatment of other conditions um, much harder. And the last thing I would say that, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of a benefit is that the earlier stages of the disease in which the individual is diagnosed, the more that individual can still participate in the decision-making process, can still do financial planning, can still do um, end-of-life care planning, um, can still make decisions about driving and, and, and when, when the keys might have to be taken away. Um, and so, so I, I don't see a downside um, um, to getting diagnosed and getting diagnosed in the earliest um, stages. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, Matthew has stressed there, in particular when you're dealing with clarification when some uh, symptoms have appeared and there's ambiguity, then I think there are very few people who would say under the circumstances, given that ambiguity exists, I don't want any clarification. So there, I think, is an, an awful lot of upside. And you've gone through that, in t especially in terms of um, caring for the individual, planning ahead, um, being able to uh, predict and share those predictions with family and friends as to what's likely to happen, I, I think it's very important. Now, in terms of testing prior to any symptoms, if you like moving much earlier into a general population where we're not anxious at the moment, there is nothing to do, there's no practical value to knowing, nor is there a, 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 a uh, uh, I mean, a practical value in terms of managing the disease, but nor is there a value in terms of preventative treatment. There, I think that's a, a, a very different question. Uh, who amongst us would want to know at age 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, you, you, you choose the cutoff, whether we were at uh, risk of Alzheimer's. Now, you start digging into that and immediately you start having to dissect the, the difficulty in that question. What risk? We're all at some risk. Um, and so at the moment we can't give you a definitive test. There are very few cases of uh, inherited Alzheimer's disease. There are a few, I think those are a separate category. But for most of the cases of Alzheimer's disease, they are quote unquote sporadic, which really means we don't know what precipitated the events, what caused it. 
So in terms of giving people uh, uh, clarification pre-symptomatically, I, I think there are an awful lot of worries there beside the fact that we can't do it. We can begin to tweak the risk of an individual. We can look at some of the genetic components they've inherited or not. We could look at some behavioral aspects of their life. And we could give them some very general generic, you know, most people given those characteristics in your position would have a risk of X percentage, but it's not a personal risk. And there I think we've got an awful lot more to do in terms of finding out who is at risk before mm -hmm. we start asking a question of whether we should tell them they're at risk. Right. Could, could I just add sure. one other thing? Because I, 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 I agree, we're talking, I was talking here about when, sim when, when symptoms occur. Um, but there are people who have, who, who um, exhibit memory problems and cognitive dysfunction who actually do not have right. dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, uh, a, a study was done looking at people who showed up at the big memory clinics and about almost one quarter of them had a treatable or reversible form of cognitive impairment. It was due to a, vit uh, a vitamin B12 deficiency or it was bad interactions with medications or it was they were suffering from depression. So one of the reasons to go in when you have memory, when, when you start to exhibit some mm -hmm. symptoms is that you may very well have not dementia or Alzheimer's, but you may have a treatable form of cognitive dysfunction. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, what we hear, I'm not a, a practicing physician and neurologist. What we hear from our neurologist colleagues is that one of the big problems when a patient comes in at that stage is uh, ambiguity and how difficult this diagnosis still is and the, the, the difficulty of that differential diagnosis. And to be able to bring clarity to that quickly and robustly and rigorously would be uh, marvelous. Yeah. Well, um, from a research perspective, I know that there is a lot of interest in uh, pushing back the diagnosis much earlier because that will help develop drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I, I've talked to several experts who have said, you know, what is the difference uh, in, in early, you know, testing for risk factor, factors for Alzheimer's disease and testing for risk factors for heart disease? We take, you know, cholesterol tests all the time. We know what our numbers are. But it seems that with Alzheimer's or, you know, even with cancer, I mean, we're always, uh, you know, encouraged to get a mammogram, to take a PSA test. There's a lot of interest in screening for disease risk. But with Alzheimer's, there does seem to be, and maybe because it's such a dreaded disease, because the death is so horrible, but there seems to be this, um, paternalistic point of view that says, uh, maybe that's information you don't need to have quite yet. Um, what, what do we do? Let's, let's get into that a little bit, because I think that, uh, you know, the research community I know is pushing for this, and there's, there are very good reasons to do it. But, you know, if people want to be tested, if people want to find out what their numbers are or what their risk is, what is the harm? It's interesting because, well, I think you can divide that quite quickly and early on into, into two areas. So one is, in terms of research, we want to test emerging drugs. And there's a very strong move in the research community now to do that uh, testing of these uh, drugs, these potential drugs, as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Because by the time someone comes to you with frank Alzheimer's disease, so much damage has been done that you're asking an awful lot of this drug to go in and, 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 and slow the process down, never mind reverse it or correct it. So there the argument is, uh, I think, a very strong one. The earlier we identify someone who is already on the path towards Alzheimer's disease, the better the chance that any drugs almost that we're thinking of, the better the chance that they'll be effective. That, that makes a lot, an awful lot of sense. And so you then start asking, well, how early? Well, if you have someone appearing with symptoms, there's every likelihood that the disease process has been at work for at least a decade, maybe two, maybe even more. And that's a critical period. So there you would be talking about research protocols, testing drugs in people before they had symptoms. But we would want to identify people who had some underlying biomarker, some underlying indication that the Alzheimer's 
mechanistically had already begun, even though symptomatically the patient felt fine and was not a patient. Separate from that, if you're talking about a, a broader uh, population effort, well, we can't tell people much about their risk. As I say, we can sort of tweak it a little bit, but we really can't tell them a whole lot about their risk uh, early on in the absence of any uh, biomarker. Now, so first of all, it's a hypothetical. But to follow the hypothetical, if we could identify, and you'd have to be very careful that you could identify it with some certainty and, and specificity, we can't have a sort of slightly woolly test that says, well, you know. Um, so assuming we could have a test with that sort of sensitivity and specificity, you then get into the question of, I can test you, I can tell you with some certainty, but I can't do really anything about it in terms of treatment. Uh, and this, is, this goes back to the data that you reported. Um, it, people would turn up for that test is what your, your research found. And that would have huge implications at a time when we don't have any treatment for them. So I think in terms of experimental treatment and research, testing early on is, is absolutely paramount. We must be doing that and there's a, there's a move to do that. In terms of moving earlier and on the assumption that this is not a research protocol, well, they're big questions. And there's been good research done on this. I mean, in other diseases, it's been interesting where when people have been asked that question, in the absence of a treatment, would you want to know? Uh, if they think they're at risk for f family reasons, then they, you know, many times they do want to know. Mm -hmm. Although some people say, for a fatal disease, I'd rather live with the ambiguity of, rather than almost the hopelessness of being told that I was going to get it, but there was no treatment. So I don't know where the population would fall out on that. Some, some very interesting and recent <coughs> research that was done at BU uh, by Bob Green, who's now moved into the, the Brigham and Harvard community, says that people are willing to um, look at that and they cope psychologically really quite well uh, oftentimes. So I think it's a, a very open and lively question. Yeah, I, I would like to throw it out to the rest of the panel. I mean, from a public policy perspective, does that, uh, you know, it seems very challenging, but uh, what, what do you do with, uh, with this, when, when the testing, the ability to uh, test for Alzheimer's disease precedes the ability to treat? Well, I, I, I think it does raise some public policy issues. Um, right now, I'm still concerned, though, with the public policy issue of getting people diagnosed now. And one of the most striking things to me about the poll results uh, was the gap. So uh, in Bob's slide that you saw, 89% of Americans said if they have memory problems, they want to go to a doctor and they want to know. And yet the studies show that 50% of the people in this country who have the disease don't know. Right. That of the 5.4 million Americans estimated with the disease, uh, half, and there is a line of evidence that suggests it could be as high as 80%, but a lot of the convergence of the studies is 50% of the people with the disease have not been diagnosed with it. And so there's a huge gap between the 50% who, who don't know and the 89% of people who want to know. And I'm still, still working on trying to close that gap um, <laughs> before, we move into, um, before we move into a place that's um, very possible, but still theoretical a few years down the road. Um, uh, I, I think we need more, more diagnosis um, of the people now with the tools and techniques we have now. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I do think the, the earlier and earlier mm -hmm. pre-symptomatic does raise uh, a lot of public policy issues, and some of them are outside the scope of the medical. What happens in the, what happens to the workplace? Um, what happens to your legal rights uh, if you know um, before right. you're symptomatic? That's right. And uh, you know, you, you, you raised the point before about how does this compare in other diseases, people, you know, do want clarity. I, I think it's quite different. So if you're thinking of something like, you know, you mentioned cancer. So if I go for my annual melanoma screening, the assumption is that if something is caught early on, it really can be fixed at, at, at point zero. We don't have that for Alzheimer's. So, so I think there's probably a very significant difference. It's the same with um, you know, cardiovascular disease. Yes, I want my cholesterol monitored closely. As soon as it starts peaking in the wrong direction, I, I, I can go on to the many drugs and I can do quite a lot to ameliorate my risk. 
but I'm, we can't. I'm curious to know your reason in particular. What kind of feedback did you get um, on this policy question when you were in Paris at the Alzheimer's meeting? Well, there there is uh, a, a concern by uh, by a share of people that we should not, as an act of policy, encourage people. Uh, to come in for a diagnosis if we can't do a lot for them. Right. So the, the uh, real public policy question is, is do we have an active campaign, the Alzheimer's community, the research community, to get people with symptoms to, to more uh, 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 narrow the gap that Matthew is uh, talking about? So that's the, the, the uh, uh, first level. I think the trade-off for the public would be is, if they were better informed about what they could or could not expect out of that assessment, then I think you have a reasonable argument for a campaign. But I think uh, you need to deal with the fact that if people have very high expectations, uh, then our campaigns have to say that they're, just like Matthew suggests, there are things you can get out of this that really would be very advantageous. But at this stage, we're not able uh, to necessarily slow the prog progression for this. The other hypothetical question, which is, is amazing interest to everybody, to all of us, what would we do if we could know at age 3, 6, 10, 12 right. uh, about this, is the furthest off from a public policy point of view. In the United States, we always start first. Individuals should be able to choose pretty much whatever they, they want to do. Uh, in other countries, that's not uh, the case. Then the second level is should insurers pay for it. And the third level is should the government have a campaign to tell you to do it. Uh, so, in the United States, my view is that there is a reliable test uh, over, we clearly will allow people who want to at least pay for it uh, to get it, and then the next question is, uh, does, it, does it go along? But I think this is it's so interesting intellectually, but the really more practical problem, I think, is Matthew's issue. What do we do with people who have symptoms, and should we really coach, coax them to go out and do that? And I, I think if uh, if uh, we can convince people that there are real advantages, then campaigns are really, uh, really the way to go and a lot of public support. But it's sort of a two-part campaign. There are advantages that you're going to get from this, but a little bit like the drug ads in the United States, there are things that we have to tell you that we may not be able to slow the progression at this, this stage, and you may need multiple types of tests before uh, we do this. That's sort of the first public policy question in my mind, how we move this forward, but how we give enough information to average people to make an informed judgment if with the symptoms they want to go. Because I think they are lacking the information that's, that would allow them to feel, I'm making an informed judgment as I, as I, I see care. And I, uh, I, yeah. and I think there has to be a campaign among the medical profession and physicians as well. I think, I think there are a lot of them, and we hear from a lot of people who come to the Alzheimer's Association who have gone through the diagnostic process. They are their loved ones and they get a diagnosis, if they get a diagnosis, and the doctor says, well, see you in a year, as if there isn't things that they need to know, whether it's medical or support services that are available, um, care planning that needs mm -hmm. to go on. Um, a, a lot of physicians say, I'm not gonna bother even when my patient says they want it because there's nothing I can do to, 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 to solve the problem. I don't have enough time. I'm not reimbursed enough to do this. Uh, there are more other important conditions that I need to treat. So I think there needs to be um, you know, an education among physicians as well, um, as well as I'd like to see, see some, reimbursement, um, uh, some reimbursement issues under Medicare addressed mm -hmm. um, to encourage physicians to, to let them know that and I think the poll results are helpful in this right. regard, mm -hmm. that their patients want to know. Right. Right. Yes. Right. It's very interesting. I mean, this is something else that came out of the Paris meeting was uh, President uh, Sarkozy stood up and addressed the audience, and he uh, reminded them that France has just passed this uh, bill to put uh, a huge, a very significant amount of funding into Alzheimer's. And um, as we were mentioning before, I mean, this is not just for research. This is to go to the issues that you mentioned, Matthew, where once someone has been given a diagnosis or a high risk, um, who does the follow-up? What is the, the, the healthcare management system of that patient and, and his or her family in the absence of a significant treatment option? Uh, telling them what to expect, roughly what the timing would be, uh, where do they transition from being looked after at home, by whom, to being looked after someone else, by whom. Um, putting in place on a national level 
the sort of um, resources you need to care for millions and millions of people with dementia, as well as, uh, you know, a, a, you, we need a phenomenal boost in the research funding because one of the other things that comes right. out of your research was right. that there's a great faith in right. the public that if we could just, you know, get some more resources in right. and, and really set our minds and go after this, we could fix it. Well, that's a heck of a responsibility to put on the research community when they're scrambling to come up with research funds. So I think this is one thing that France has done, which is a, a, a model. If, if, uh, so I'm from Britain, but if either in Britain or the US we were to do something like this and put in equivalent amounts of money d based on the size of our populations and think we need a plan to care for those who have dementia now, who will get it over the next decade be you know, whilst we're waiting for drugs, and we need a plan that says we need to get to those drugs as soon as possible, and it, you know, it doesn't happen in a year or two. I mean, one of the things that came out of your research is that people will assume that progress will be much more rapid. Right if the funding was there. And so we better get started on the funding now because the expectation already is that, you know, we could do so much more if we had a bit more money. There's one finding that is a, uh, important culturally here. We asked people if someone in your immediate family were to get the disease, who would be the primary caretaker? Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. in France and Germany, the primary caretaker is not a family member. In the other three countries, the primary caregiver is mostly a spouse, but then followed by children. Right. So the decisions you make about the types of support services uh, affect even average people's perceptions. But in France and Germany, they didn't envision that their family member would be the principal person having to manage uh, this care. They were relying on somebody else that would help do this. Where in the United States, it was just perfectly clear this is something that you would be doing uh, or a family member. So uh, there are different approaches to this and uh, the culture uh, really does matter. And I, it's, I'm not surprised the French model uh, has more outside assistance to family members than I think people expect at the moment in these other countries. You know, I, I, I'm delighted that my panel does all my work for me, but I did want to open it up for questions. Uh, from the audience, so please, uh, you know, if you could identify yourself, and uh, you know, I'd love to take your questions too. Does anyone? Okay, um, we have a question here. Um, my name is James Gilbert. I'm a practicing physician, and I'm here for our master's program at Harvard. Uh, you know, the, the the gist of what you're talking about here is in terms of what we do has the implication of limited resources, and uh, and we know in a perfect world with unlimited resources we could do many of these things. Also, you mentioned about. Um, public's expectation, and we know there's often a wide disparity between their expectation and what they're willing to pay for, that is, each of us being a member of that, that group that pays for it. Do you, with those kind of things in mind, uh, are, do you see that we're, we have adequate plans at this point to deal with, as, this, as our population ages, uh, the, the increasing numbers of patients just simply doing basic care? But this is, I mean, so th this is so important, what you raise. If we had a flat line with Alzheimer's disease, I'm sure some would argue that maybe we can get by. We don't have anything like a flat line. We have this dramatic increase. And, I, and again, part of this sort of public education so that the public can be our advocates for more resources um, is required. Because what we're actually facing is, uh, is, is two things. First of all, most many populations around the world are gradually uh, aging in their demographic. That is to say people are living longer, which is a success story, so that's fantastic. But with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, the biggest risk factor that we know of is age. So the older the population is in terms of its overall demographic, the more patients with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So that's one factor. In addition, in certain countries we have this, in the states in particular, we have this sort of boomer generation coming through, which is on top of that aging demographic, pushing through a, 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 a big a group of, uh, of, of boomers. Um, and then thirdly, we have a, a global perspective that says many countries, and in particular most of the developed um, uh, rich economic countries, uh, recognize now what Alzheimer's is and they're beginning to do a reasonable job at, at, at counting them up. As Matthew said, it's not perfect, even in some countries, you know, 50% of those with Alzheimer's probably don't know they have it yet, but nonetheless, we have a recognition. 
But the big push in Alzheimer's in terms of a challenge globally is going to come from countries where that is not in place. And if you look at India and China, where there's much less understanding of what Alzheimer's is and how big a part of their future medical care it's going to be, the numbers are just phenomenal. So what we're seeing is this, if you, if you graph this out, it's really quite amazing. We are right now, 2011, 2012, on this very dramatic inflection point where the increase, the rate of increase of Alzheimer's patients is just, we're just turning that and heading into the steepest part of the curve, such that over the next 40 years, we can very, and uh, healthcare economists and statisticians argue a little bit about this, but we can expect somewhere between at least a doubling, a tripling, maybe four times as many patients over the next 40 years. And just to put that in perspective, the amount of money we spend on Alzheimer's care now, and the total cost of it, lost productivity, etc., is a staggering 1% of global GDP. Now, that's 1% of the, you know, that I, I, when I first came across that number, I, I had to go back and check it. I must have read that incorrectly. 1% <laughs> of GDP. And we're just at the start of the steep part of the curve. So I'm not sure what the answer to your question is, except that we both locally, nationally, internationally, globally, we have to recognize that this could really be, a, you know, if not the, then one of the biggest health challenges facing us. And at the moment, most countries are still umming and ahhing about how big a problem it really is, uh, which is staggering. Yeah. Yeah. And the policy implications of, go, uh, 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 of, where, of where we're headed uh, are, are tremendous. And, uh, you know, there's the old cliche, a penny saved is a penny earned. And I would argue that a penny spent now is many, many, many pennies saved uh, I I in the future on this. Um, uh, we, uh, today we spend, uh, this year in the United States, about $183 billion caring for people with the disease. 70% of that is tax dollars, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, that number is going to go up to, without counting inflation, over a trillion dollars by 2050. So that's a trillion dollars in today's dollars. And again, over 800 billion of that will be tax dollars, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so it seems to me that if we, if we can make an investment now in the research that's needed, we can save a lot of those costs down the road. And you don't need a cure. The, the economic models show that if you have a treatment that delays onset of the disease by only five years, so a drug, uh, if, if Alzheimer's had a drug like Lipitor, um, uh, you would save uh, the, the cost that would be saved in 2050, 45%. So 45% of that $1 trillion would be saved simply by a drug that delayed onset of the disease for five years. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think there's a lot of, in, a little bit of investment at the front end. And that is true, I think, on something like what do you do with the folks who get a diagnosis and not just on the research. I think it's incredibly important on the research end. But if you look at something like um, a, a study out of New York University, it gave caregivers a series of six counseling sessions and um, then compared them with the, uh, these were Alzheimer's caregivers, compared them with the control group of Alzheimer's caregivers who did not get uh, those counseling sessions. Nursing home placement for the patient was delayed when the, when the caregiver got six counseling sessions by a year and a half. Now the typical Alzheimer's patient will spend about three years in a nursing home. So you're talking about cutting that in half. So if, if you're talking about Medicaid, which is mostly nursing home spending, spending $37 billion this year caring for people with Alzheimer's, and you're saying let's delay by half, uh, you can see the advantage of spending a little bit of money to make sure that people know about these counseling programs, that they have care planning because of, the, because of the larger cost savings um, that would accrue. Uh, let me uh, add to this. If you, if you were uh, at the European meetings, uh, one common word would be there, the new austerity. So if you're asking me if people are going to spend money, uh, I could have tapped this someone from Spain or Germany, and they go, no. <laughs> and so, uh, but if you actually look at the data, when you have uh, the second uh, uh, disease that people are most concerned about getting, 
you've got the demographic issues, and you have a faith that science can push this back. Once the new austerity eases up, this is going to be a priority issue, and it corresponds to sort of a public preference and then a real policymaker. Uh, most of the people I survey don't look at 20-year economic expenditures on health. That's not a lot of what they think about, but policy people will. And what they do think about is what I'm most worried about getting, and can you do something to slow this down? So I think when the feelings of new austerity will ease in some time, you'll find this actually will be a popular political priority to try to change the, the outcome here. But I'm always concerned because in this time, no will be the common budgetary word uh, in, across these five countries, yeah. and, but, but not over time. But I was, I, I was surprised by the polling because there was a yeah. question, do you, in your poll, yeah. do you think the government should spend more yeah. on, on Alzheimer's research? And in the United States, I mean, we don't call it the new austerity here, but uh, in the United States, we have a certain political climate um, uh, uh, right now, and I was I was very surprised that 61 percent of the people, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the political climate we're in, were saying we need to we should spend more on Alzheimer's research. But for those in the medical research community, when the money does come, you will be under enormous pressure, as we talked yeah. about, because there will be this faith that just give you four or five years to really pound away at this. <laughs> and where, where are you with mom and dad? We invested in this, and can you show us that you're pushing this back? Well, it'll be a great problem to have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to throw out it, it out to another question. Is there anybody else up here in the front? Hi, my name's Alan Silverberg. Uh, I'm a practicing physician, and I'm a member uh, here at the Harvard School of Public Health as a student. And uh, could you just briefly delineate the tests that you were discussing as part of the studies, and also the present state of uh, management with, med with what medications are available, what's on the horizon? Well, we have a, a dearth of neurologists on, on the panel, so I don't know that we'll be going into the management in, in, in a lot of detail. The state of the tests is very interesting. It, it's, uh, it really is at a bit of a turning point. Um, there's no test for Alzheimer's disease now, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on what we call sporadic Alzheimer's disease. There are uh, rare cases of Alzheimer's disease which are clearly inherited through families, and we can look for the uh, mutations that are responsible for those, but those are, those are only a few percentages of the total. So for sporadic Alzheimer's disease, there's no test. Now, those who are on the uh, forefront of, of this technology would say that there are a couple of things that are on the horizon, and I would agree with them, and that is in terms of imaging tests. So there are some tests now, both um, from the magnetic resonance imaging and functional MRI in particular, but even more so from PET imaging, positron emission tomography imaging, where we can actually uh, look inside non-invasively uh, at a patient or someone who's at risk, and we can look to see to what extent these very characteristic uh, pathological hallmarks are present in their brain, these uh, plaques. Uh, we can also look to see if the brain is, uh, is shrinking or deteriorating, although you need to have quite advanced disease for that. The question at the moment is, is, is twofold. How uh, really specific are those tests? There's some evidence to suggest that some of those characteristics that we were looking for, that we are looking for, are present in people who, as far as we can tell, really don't even have any early stage disease. Is it just a question of waiting because they are about to convert from healthy to demented? We don't yet know that, and you have to do longitudinal studies and follow that. The second issue is that's a very expensive test, uh, generally. You know, what we would like is we would like something where we could do something very simple, maybe a simple blood test, something akin to what we do for uh, cardiovascular disease screening where we do a cholesterol test. You know, we don't really care about our cholesterol in our, in our bloodstream. We, the only reason we care is because it tells us that we're at risk of cardiovascular disease later on. Could we come up with something equivalent, a so-called biomarker? That's a very active field of research at the moment. There are groups all over the world looking at that, and that's just beginning to emerge as Perhaps there is going to be uh, a, a fairly complicated, multidimensional biomarker. If you put those two things, a blood-based biomarker or maybe cerebral spinal fluid-based biomarker, if you put those, all, the, all that together, and so if you go to 
the best research hospitals in the world who have all the technology and uh, conducting these trials, then there's a good chance that you could accurately tell someone at a very early stage that they have Alzheimer's disease prior to what we could do five years ago, or even a little earlier than that, pre-symptomatically or just on the edge. And there's, there's, there's quite a gray area between not demented and demented. You know, there are various sort of categories of prodromal or mild cognitive impairment. So it depends where you are in that spectrum. But yes, you could probably do quite a lot in that area, but it's phenomenally expensive. And it's not something that is ready to be rolled out to the population. So you could use that to, to go back to the drug trials. You could use that to influence the drug trials, identify people who seem to be just before symptoms. They look like they're going to get the disease and test the drugs in those. And that's m very important, a very powerful technology. But it's not really going to be a population level test. Pretty Lucani, Masters in Healthcare Management here at Harvard. How can we get, fr what, what happened in France, how can we replicate that here? How do we get the decision makers, the, per the purse string holders to replicate what happened in France here? Um, we're, we're actually in the process of doing that. Um, so last, um, last December, um, Congress uh, passed what's called the National Alzheimer's Project Act. Uh, NAPA is, is the acronym for short. Uh, it was signed into law by President Obama on January 4th of this year. Uh, and that requires the federal government to create a plan like, um, uh, like they have in France, to create a national plan for how we're going to deal with the uh, escalating numbers of people that will have this disease and the implications on our healthcare system, what we're going to do on the research front to really begin to pump the money that's needed um, uh, to, find, to find treatments. Um, and the, um, um, the, the Department of Health and Human Services has, is in the process now of um, appointing the advisory council uh, that it was required by the act. And we expect that by this time next year, at the latest, um, we, think they're on a, we, we think they're on a faster timeline to hit the spring next year. We will have a national plan in the United States. The key then, though, is whether we are able to do what they did in France. It's one thing to come up with the plan, and it wasn't easy getting a bill through Congress. Um, um, but it's one thing to come up with the plan. It's another to have the commitment to implement the recommendations in the plan. And the one thing about France is you have um, a commitment from President Sarkozy, the president of the country, saying, we're going to implement this plan. And every six months, I'm going to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the person who is overseeing this plan, and I'm getting a progress report every six months and because we are dedicated to implementing this. And I think, um, so we're in, a good, we're in a good place right now. It took us a long time to get there. Um, and uh, we're going to have a, a written national plan, and then the task will be, um, will we have the support and dedication um, uh, of the policymakers to implement it? But we're heading in the right direction. Yes, here. Asim Chima, School of Public Health. And the question is that uh, there are two implications for the test. One is a diagnostic, the other one is a screening. Uh, I don't know whether we have enough information at this time to move it from the diagnostic, even from the diagnostic to screening, because we don't know the subclinical duration of the disease. We don't know whether this progression can be even uh, slowed down. And even for diagnostic, I think even if we have the test, the cost of the test itself uh, would uh, state whether how applicable it is. And then again, whether diagnosing the disease itself, I think most of this would be driven by the treatment uh, paradigm, uh, where it works, how much it works, and at what stage it will be effective. Because if we find that there is no effective treatment available, then obviously the diagnostic tests will not be helpful. Mm. I think that's absolutely right. You outlined that beautifully. Um, there are all sorts of different tests, and we tend to lump them together and call it the Alzheimer's test. But you're absolutely right. Testing specifically uh, at what stage and for what. And the, and the additional uh, category of tests that I would throw into your nice summary there is the test 
where we want to actually, once we've defined someone has the disease, we then want to accurately and in a very uh, a quantifiable way, we want to monitor their disease progression. And this is key for drug discovery. So a lot of what we've been saying today depends on where well, we don't have any drugs now. I mean, the ones that we have are really very, very limited. So we don't have any disease modifying drugs and we don't have much in the way of uh, drugs that would help with disease management. So once, uh, if we're going to get to that, we're going to go through a lot of drug testing. And the, the pro one of the problems with Alzheimer's now, the sort of complexity that you summarize there is that the drug trials are so expensive because the readout of the trial is so very fuzzy and, 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 and non-quantifiable. So we have a patient who, who's got early stages or, or moderate stages of dementia, and we bring them in and we ask them some psychological and some memory questions. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, if you get me on a good day, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about those tests. You get me on a bad day, I'd say, don't record those results, give me another chance. And we have the same in the patient population, of course. So th that data is very fuzzy, it goes up and down. And if that's your readout of whether a drug is working, that's, that's, very, that's problematic. So what we also want, in addition to the test you mentioned, is we want a disease progression test. Preferably something very simple, a blood-based or CSF-based, you know, not a psychological or a memory test, not a behavioral test, something simple that we could measure and get a number on. That would allow us to do drug trials much over a much shorter duration. And of course, the cost of the trial is linked in many ways to the duration of the trial. So the better the disease progression testing you have, the shorter and therefore the less expensive the trials, and therefore the more trials to conduct. There is not at the moment a shortage of trials waiting to be done. There's a shortage of the many millions of dollars required to do that because they are very high risk trials. Most of them fail. They've all pretty much failed to date and that will continue to be the case. But you know, some of us believe that the more shots on goal we get, the better chance of scoring. <laughs> so um, you know, I, I, think, I think you're right and I, and I think that's part of the research community's challenges uh, to make sure that we've got the, the diagnosis accurate, the disease progression accurate, the risk assessment accurate. I have a question here. Um, I'm Robin Herman. I'm director of the forum. And one of the features of the forum is that we take questions from our online viewers. And uh, quite a few viewers from around the country have been asking questions that are very specific uh, about what they can do now. Speaking to your um, observations that people you know, want something and want something fast. And uh, quite a few questions about, well, how about diet? Does, um, uh, do food patterns influence risk? Does your BMI, your uh, body mass index, influence risk? What about keeping your mind active? Does that influence risk? Um, I've had at least 10 questions. Um, one here from a registered dietitian, Joseph Gonzalez, saying, do we have research on food patterns and food that influence risk? Yeah, it, it, these questions, of course, uh, come up uh, a, a lot, and the answer is, frankly, going to be very unsatisfactory. Let me just put that proviso in there. Um, I, I, there is a general answer which says that uh, a healthy body is good for a healthy mind, uh, if I can make it generic, um, that uh, avoiding other health risks such as cardiovascular disease is only going to be helpful in terms of maintaining our, our, our cognitive health, our mental health. And so pretty much anything that a physician is telling you to do in terms of maintaining your physical uh, health is going to be a positive thing. Um, so that's important and you know for some people that could make uh, quite a difference uh, one imagines. However, these are not things that are going to have much of an impact once the disease process has started and once that downward chronic trajectory is underway. There isn't a whole lot we can do. So should you be health conscious? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the couch potato to me suggests someone who's not only physically inactive but mentally inactive. Those are two things we should correct as far as we can. Uh, in terms of diet, well, we know what is a healthy diet, and it's not directly related to Alzheimer's, it's directly related to our, our broader health. So these things uh, are important for people to pay attention to. But if someone comes in with Alzheimer's disease early stages, is this going to do much for them? Frankly, no. 
Uh, Daryl Flaherty. I'm with the Alzheimer's Association in Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Um, Matthew, you mentioned uh, National Alzheimer's Project Act. I'm wondering on, f on two points. Could you speak just a bit about the HOPE legislation recently, recently formulated uh, for the two reasons that, uh, one, will it address the gross issue of failure to diagnose in this country this disease? And secondly, how will it address the fact that uh, caregivers, so we've always talked about this disease as a disease that affects families. We know that most of the caregivers are older. They have a couple of chronic health conditions of their own. We know that their care burden affects their health, makes them sicker, affects their mortality. That's part of what is being neglected in this country, are treatments and approaches for the caregivers themselves. And there is some evidence that what is good for the caregiver also helps the patient. Thank yep. you. And, I, 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 and, there's, and there's evidence that, the, that, that an earlier diagnosis not only helps the patient, it helps the, care, the, the caregiver. The legislation that you referred to, the HOPE for Alzheimer's Act, uh, HOPE stands for uh, Health Outcomes Planning and Education. Um, and it is, it is aimed really at that gap that I talked about earlier, the 89% who want to know and the 50% um, uh, who don't know. Um, um, by, by targeting really the issue of uh, what happens in the physician office and one of the reasons physicians don't do this and that's a reimbursement issue. And so this, is a, uh, this says um, uh, in Medicare, if there is detection of cognitive impairment, so if there's some reason to suspect that there is um, um, a, a cognitive problem, um, then this legislation would kick in a package of services that includes a full diagnostic evaluation. And then if that diagnostic evaluation shows, um, results in a diagnosis of Alzheimer's uh, or, or other dementia, then there's uh, care planning services provided uh, uh, to the patient and to the family caregiver um, so that they know the medical options that are available as well as the uh, community-based non-medical support services such as that counseling program um, that are available. Um, so it's, it's, it's to um, uh, hopefully encourage physicians um, through the reimbursement mechanism to, to, um, um, to want to diagnose more and then it's to make that diagnosis more effective which we believe will ultimately be, the, um, be what saves costs and provides for better quality of care. Well, this has been a, a wonderful discussion. Thank you to uh, my audience. I'd like to just give my panel members about 30 seconds each to maybe summarize their thoughts if you have any additional comments. And um, who would like to start? Well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump in first. I, um, a lot of what we've discussed is all about the challenge and the, and, and the very significant difficulties. I would not want the audience to leave with the impression that this is in any way hopeless. The the, the stage we're at at understanding the underlying cause of Alzheimer's disease today is so much better than it was just 10 years ago. It really is quite different. And um, in our profession of biomedical research, we have to be optimistic, of course, otherwise it would be a very depressing field. Um, <laughs> but but, but um, I think there is a real reason for optimism at the moment, uh, beyond our natural optimism. And that is to say that there are so many issues and questions and very specific and tangible research directions that we are eager and desperate to follow and we cannot fund them. So I, I, I think a big part of this goes back to some of the data that you were saying uh, that you showed us that um, the, 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 the broader community expects that a solution will be found if funding is given. Their expectation is probably um, a bit too much for us to meet in terms of the timing. But in general, I would agree with them. I would say that this, the bottleneck here at the moment is in funding and it has to be a major funding commitment. Dr. Blunder? Well, uh, I th think uh, you have a whole series of public education issues mm -hmm. uh, that are here. If we have a campaign, then we really have to explain to people what they can expect and not expect. Uh, also, I think the interest in breakthroughs is so enormous 
uh, it's something where we want to keep people up to date where we are on every one of these issues. I'm sure three months from now, what do you know about diet? What do you know about the tests? What do you know about the treatment? So the importance of broad public education is going to be very, very uh, important here. But I think there is going to be a sea change of public interest in investing in this. And that's not because I did a study. It's when you've looked at how public responds to various issues, uh, this is an unusually high priority to people. And so you're going to find that four or five years from now, the intense interest of tell us more about France, tell us more about where we are in the medical science is going to really be pushing this field. So as somebody studies the public, my big question is, can the expectations be met? But not that there will not be huge public support, I think, for moving ahead on these issues. And Matthew, I just want to give you a Yeah, just very briefly. Yeah. Um, um, Bob's poll shows there's, um, uh, that the people want to know. I think the, the um, overwhelming evidence shows there's a value of knowing. Yeah. And an investment now will pay off in, in dividends, both in quality of care and cost savings in the long run. We have a lot of problems ahead of us, but it sounds like we have a, uh, some reason to hope. I want to thank you all for attending, and uh, you know we'll keep on working ahead. And meanwhile, I hope you have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>